So Fabio is going to join us a couple minutes late, but I think we'll just get started without him. Um, our uh, uh, illustrious uh, uh, guide for this experience is is Wei Sun. Uh, so Wei, I'm, I'm just going to immediately hand this over to you. And thank you so much for cool. running. Yeah, so Max chose me to host this because I don't know anything. Um, which was some interesting criteria to choose someone <laughs> based off of. Uh, we're going to be talking about AI today, which seems to be a pretty big topic. Uh, there's a lot of people saying a lot of different things, and I don't know uh, what to believe. I have no idea what's going on, so that's why I'm really thankful for the opportunity to uh, hear for some ec from some experts who might actually have a clue. Um, let's start with some intros. Maybe Avijit, you could go first, talk about your experience in this area. Sure. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Avijit. Uh, I was in Max's cohort. Uh, basically, I got my PhD from Northeastern in June. Um, currently, I am a research data scientist at uh, Adept ID, which is an AI company based in Boston. And also, my second job is teaching responsible machine learning as an adjunct at Northeastern this fall. So I've been teaching undergrads. Uh, my research focus is mainly on the real world challenges of FAIR ML. So it's one thing to develop a FAIR machine learning algorithm in the lab, but when you try and implement it in the real world, it has certain other challenges to make this FAIR ML model continue to behave unfairly. So that's what my research focus was on. And I'm using that expertise to help um, candidates find better jobs at my company. Um, Could you explain what FAIR means? I, I don't think I've heard of that before. Um, so one example is, let's say we think about uh, facial recognition systems. Um, we know because of historical training, like data sets were trained on biased, uh, 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 you know, sorry, models were trained on biased data sets and these biased data sets overrepresent people with darker skin which leads these uh, facial recognition systems that are being used by the police, by the way, to overcorrect uh, because of the bias data sets and identify innocent black people as criminals much far more often than uh, white people. So that's an example of a biased model and a fair model would not do that. So, so that's like sort of the general concept of fairness, basically a model that, not, that does not discriminate now, definitions of fairness can vary widely based on context. So the example that I gave you was an example where the false positive rates were different between the two groups, but you could also look at something like whether the accuracies were the same for the two groups or multiple groups, or whether the false negative rates were different. So in a medical context, I think false negative rates are far more important than false positive rates because you don't want somebody to falsely be diagnosed as, as, as like, not having the disease. And you know, even in medical context, there are racial disparities that have been well studied and models are being used. So basically the, the to summarize everything in a few sentences, um, a fair model is something that does not discriminate based on uh, a human being's immutable characteristic. Mm, that sounds very interesting. And I do wanna get into that later, but before we do that, maybe David, uh, could introduce himself. Hello, everyone. My name is David. Um, I'm going to try and turn the nonsense level up a bit. Um, uh, my name is David. I just earned my PhD from Carnegie Mellon. Um, I'm joining you live from New York uh, University in Manhattan. I'm actually I'm a postdoc at Cornell Tech, but I'm here because it is the uh, Labor Notes Tech Worker Action uh, Conference. Um, a group of folks uh, organized by Labor Notes trying to um, help unionize tech workers. Um, so. Uh, I did my PhD in AI ethics, and both of those are a little suspect, both those words, AI, hmm, um, statistics with fancier Greek letters and a lot more GPUs, and ethics, what does that actually mean? And, and my PhD research was trying to figure out um, what people who've been told to do AI ethics in their job um, see, like what they understand of their ability, their agency to um, act on their ethical concerns, and what they feel the responsibility is to do that in the first place. And my research shows that a lot of the ways we think about AI ethics um, are not the ways that people see concerns. Like um, the, I did a survey, for example, of people who work in tech who have concerns with what they've been asked to create. They were concerned about things like ad tracking, just creepy ads. They were con concerned about creepy surveillance. And they weren't really expressing these um, 
And I put this at FACT, which is Fair Accountable Transparent Conference. And the kind of the point was the, the design characteristics, fair, accountable, transparent, are not really the ways that people conceive of their ethical concerns. And what stops them resolving their concerns is not a, um, a shortfall in the number, in like the kinds of uh, technical solutions to make things fair, accountable, or transparent, but the lack of power, the lack of power over what they've been told to create. Um, and that's why I mentioned I met labor notes. I think um, the way we're gonna get ethical AI is by giving workers agency and power in the workplace. Um, and being more critical, not of the algorithms themselves, but of who's using them and what kind of material resources they have and what that's doing to our planet. Uh, one thing to mention is AI, as I mentioned briefly, depends on a ton of um, GPUs or very fancy computer chips that love to use a lot of power. So in some ways we can see AI as a project to badly, but attempt to automate work um, and concentrate capital higher uh, for bosses. And do that badly. Uh, it it doesn't. It will get healthcare provided by AI, and it will work badly for us. But the the bosses will be still seeing human doctors. So, I'm trying to inject a bunch of like heterodox opinions in the in the stream here. But I'm excited to be here. Thanks for the invite. And um, way if you have any questions with all those words, I'd be happy to. Yeah, definitely. I I definitely want to get into all of that. Um, only constraint being time, but I think we have one more. A speaker here. So Fabio, if you could introduce yourself and uh, talk about your experience with AI. Sure. Thanks. And sorry, everyone, for, for being late. I was stranded in the English countryside and my cab took like an hour to arrive. Fabio, but your I'm audio here. your audio is a bit um, staticky. It's actually quite staticky. So I'm not sure what the issue is there. I'm going to try with my video off. If, if that's okay. Is that better? Uh, yeah, I think it's I think it's all right. Can deal that's, with it. That's frustrating. Um, okay, is, so is it manageable or not at all? It just Max, got. A... Still think Max is nodding. So let's let's keep going with it. Okay. Okay. I'll introduce myself and then I'll see if I can I can connect I can use my phone as a hotspot. That might be better. Um, but I, I'll yeah we'll do it just now. Um, so yeah, I'm Fabio. I'm a a postdoc at the, okay, I can actually, I can switch mics. That's a good call. Um, give me a sec. While we're waiting, should we get into one of these topics maybe? Um, I think we should. Okay, is that better? Oh, yeah, that's much, that's way better. Okay, cool, that was, that was the fix. Um, okay, I'm gonna try with my, my camera on now and see if that, if that's still okay. Is the audio still good? Yes. Ah. Sorry, everyone. Okay. All good. Um, cool. So my name is Fabio. I'm a postdoc at the University of Edinburgh. Um, my research focuses on um, our project is about trying to enable a responsible AI ecosystem in the UK and globally. Um, my own research looks at trying to map what responsible AI looks like. So in the EU, for example, we've had a lot of stuff on uh, responsible research and innovation from about 2014, 2015. And that was a huge policy discussion and that involved looking at different kinds of scientific disciplines trying to generate or trying to think through how we might um, govern innovative technologies. So technologies where we're not quite sure on what the, the effects or the impacts of those technologies might be. Um, so I'm trying to trace out what we've lost in that discussion because that discussion was a very high level, very advanced discussion that had a lot of people talking about it. And it seems like the responsible AI discussion it seems like we're rehashing a lot of those problems again. Um, and I think I heard a bit of what, what David said towards the end, which is something about how we've lost focus of, about the people or governance and the tech has taken up a lot of the space and a lot of the, the airtime. Um, so what I'm trying to do is show how, how what's got lost along the way is it's kind of a, it's a marketing issue where, where we've been sold something about the product and told that it's the product that's the real innovative thing that we need to focus on. But really what's happening is how this is affecting labor and power and the concentration of power. Um, so that's that's kind of what I'm interested in. Um, yeah, but I also have a background. My um, original research was in questions of, of agency and whether AI systems um, should be conceived of as agents. Um, and I think that's also especially relevant when I look at sort of very basic textbooks as sort of Russell and Norvig's introduction to artificial intelligence there, there's this very basic assumption that AI systems are agential, right? They have goals, therefore, then they can achieve those goals and that makes them agents. And I'm especially interested in, in sort of the capacities that are required for agency. Um, and I'm quite skeptical of, of that very sort of simplistic model. 
Okay, yeah. I think that's a really good segue into the first question I had, um, which is that I hear some people saying AI is incredibly dangerous and it's going to get totally out of hand in the next few years and it's out of control. I hear other people saying that like the panic is totally overblown. AI is shouldn't even be called AI. Like it's a misnomer because it's not actually intelligent at all. So I'm curious how you all assess the actual danger. Uh, maybe we start with Abhijit on this one. So my understanding is that uh, what we call AI today are essentially very powerful pattern matchers. And because they sort of very nicely predict what the, the probability distribution of words, say we're talking about language model. So because they very powerfully predict the sort of words or distribution of words that a human would say, people assume that what it's producing is intelligent and it has an internal thought process. Um, but if you, if anyone's familiar with the stochastic parrots paper, and I sort of agree with what they said, even though their views are a bit more extreme than what I have, is that we as humans have tendency to ascribe meaning to a set of words when they appear in an order that we expect it to. So this is famously like has been observed since the sixties called the Eliza effect. So in the sixties, there was this therapy chatbot. Um, called Eliza, which basically just asked questions about what you said in the previous sentence. So if you said, I am sad and depressed today, the response would be, why do you think you're sad or depressed? You know, And people used to think that this bot was intelligent, but it had a very fixed, very simple rule system. So the conclusion from that study was that we have a, a uh, tendency to ascribe meaning and emotion to words. Another example is when an ATM prints out like, you know, your receipt and in the end it says, thank you, come again. That makes us feel happy, even though we know that it's a fixed string of words that was printed there. The machine does not have any emotions or any desire to make you quote unquote happy. So, so today's LLMs are a more advanced version of that effect. Um, Sorry, LLM? Yeah, large language models. So mm -hmm. things like ChatGPT. Um, and uh, so, so all of this talks about the fact that these are generalized machine intelligence or, or AGI, artificial general intelligence, is basically, to my understanding, an extended version of the Eliza effect. Like, I don't see uh, any way in which the current paradigm of autoregressive models, which, is, which are models that try and predict the next bunch of uh, words or tokens, have a path to something that can think and perceive on its own. And one easy proof for that is, uh, so two things. First, uh, because ChatGPT is designed as a conversational agent, it seems like it's interacting with you, but if you try and paste a long document, it will try to continue the document. So it's essentially trained on token completion, right? Uh, but people don't understand it because they are trying to talk with it and it tries to emulate a document which was a dialogue. So um, the other thing that you can understand why it, it's not intelligent is because sometimes it will try and complete things where that fact did not exist at all. Um, so basically it generates misinformation. And to me, the current danger is not coming from the models themselves or any fear of the models themselves becoming sentient or intelligent and dangerous, but from humans trusting these models too much because of the Eliza effect or because of mm -hmm people trying to ascribe neutrality to models. Uh, you know, you're probably also familiar with image generating models, right? Like uh, something like Dolly. Um, I saw this tweet a few months ago where somebody from the Dominican Republic like literally wrote the two prompts, um, a Dominican family and a Haitian family. And it generated very stereotypical uh, white look like skin people for the Dominican Republic family and dark skin people for the Haitian. And the person tweeted these side-by-side -side images with the caption saying, it is now finally proven. Uh, AI is neutral and it's right. Haitians are dark skinned and so you guys should leave the country. So there is like racial tension in the Dominican Republic towards the minority Haitian community. So that is my uh, problem with AI as it is advertised. It's advertised as an all-knowing, neutral, unbiased agent that has learned a complete model of the world, but none of those things are true. 
and the humans who are being misinformed with uh, about the capabilities of these models are the true danger to humanity and not the models themselves yeah i think that ties in really well with what uh david you were saying earlier about like the role of labor so did you have anything you wanted to add to that I'd, I'd broadly agree. I think just to be clear, AI is not going to become sentient. And anyone who's telling you that it will has a vested interest in you believing that, um, whether to lobby um, for uh, basically like restrictions on AI development that entrench their own position. Think about Sam Altman, think about OpenAI currently having the most powerful, well, one of the most powerful, whatever the hell that means, models. Um, and then not want anyone else to build something that becomes more uh, powerful. So they're sort of using this as a lobbying tactic. Um, but uh, what Abhijit said is true, is that like the current short-term risks are the ones with bias, are the ones with um, discrimination. But I think that we ought to be also see AI as a tool to uh, discipline labor and to automate labor. Um, and just to explain a little bit what that means, um, Think of all of these suggestions to use like AI as a therapy or large language models or chat GPT therapy, right? That will probably end up in a very poor like version of therapy, but it's probably gonna be like, it's gonna automate a bunch of therapists. It's gonna take their jobs and it's gonna be the, the, the people like us, the people who aren't rich, who get told to see this AI therapist. So um, I'm concerned about, um, and, and just to be clear, Sam Altman is still, if he needs to see a therapist, which he does, um, is gonna see a human therapist, right? He's not gonna, he's not gonna eat his own dog food as we say in the tech industry. He's gonna um, still have the, 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 the human interaction um, version of whatever he's trying to sell us as being automated. So, um, it's it's difficult because AIs I don't think will ever ever perform on the level of a human therapist, but um, it's gonna get good enough that people are gonna try and like essentially put AI in places where um, it doesn't belong to either like stretch what human work can do so you can like make people more efficient but just make the service worse or um, just give poor versions of whatever human service is being given. Um, and then that will end up with, uh, and then again, what that does is that concentrates power. So like that concentrates wealth. So when we talk about AI ethics, we shouldn't be really talking about, I, I think we should be talking about bias, but I think what we should be really talking about is the reason that bias happens is because we have invested power in the AI system, as Evajit said, and the people controlling the AI system are the ones with that power. So we ought to, ought to see um, AI for how it affects um, power relations to, power relations in a market and power relations in society um, and the, the AI or the particular technical working is sort of secondary. Yeah. Um, and maybe Fabio, you could talk to like agential concerns regarding AI because Avijit was saying, and I think Avijit and David were both saying that like these are not going to be conscious systems. They're never going to be conscious systems. I guess my question is how would we know, right? Something I found interesting um i forgot who said this but the idea was like these systems are maybe redefining how we think of intelligence like what is consciousness what is intelligence how would we know for a fact that these systems are not agents well how do we know for a fact that you're conscious or that anyone else in this room is conscious like for a fact um to put it that way you know so i think I think there's a there's an important sort of conceptual thing that we need to get clear on, which is that consciousness, if it is anything, it's probably a social phenomena that emerges. Like if we're going to think of consciousness in in terms of the way that it's emerged for our species, it's something that is part of our social identity and that has emerged sort of in interpersonal relations with others. And you know, the way that I know I'm conscious is kind of by testing it on you and the way that you, you know I'm conscious is by sort of checking my behaviors and my responses over time. So there's also this temporal aspect to it. So I think I'm skeptical of putting it as sort of this, this true or false, you know, whether we know for a fact whether an mm -hmm. AI system would be conscious or not, but rather, well, let's think about how it's embedded, the ways it responds to different prompts, different inputs, and then, you know, see it as a system that can evolve over time into having, I don't know what kinds of, of capacities. 
but you would certainly certainly need at least at a basic level some kind of social embedding and only then i think does it make sense to start asking the question mm, what uh, do you of mean whether... by that social embedding well i would think sort of uh embedding in a kind of a, a, a community of peers where there is interaction with different members of the group um, over a period of time and where the entity, whatever it is, gains some level of concern in that group. So what I mean by that is something like, um, let's take, for example, care robots. So the, the, these are sort of robots that are designed to care in some cases for the elderly when, you know, labor is short. And many, many people have, have sort of, I think this is part of the Eliza effect where people have actually started to develop um, or they've started trying to design these robots in ways that are amenable to what um, people who need this kind of care would want to expect from human carers, right? So they're designed to look to have sort of um, anth anthropomorphic um, traits or they can um, converse very basically. So it makes the people who they're helping feel kind of at ease. Um, to those people who are getting that kind of care, those robots might mean something. Mm. in the sense that they matter to them and that mattering is not the kind of mattering of i don't know a teddy bear or you know you might think it is but it seems like there's something a bit more going on there's a kind of important relation between that person and the artifact and mm. i would still push back until even in those cases we're not talking about questions of consciousness we're talking about questions of moral relations moral and social relations and ultimately those depend on on the humans the human parts of those relations but I think if we're going to get a discussion off the ground about sentience or, or agency or intelligence, we have to start from the basic assumption that agency and intelligence are properties that are embedded in social environments um, and parts of social systems, not sort of, um, they're not facts about the world in a sense mm. so we can sort of look into the world and see that that's an agent, that's an agent, rather they're facts about social and cultural communities. Yeah, something I found really interesting um, I think it was on the podcast, Your Undivided Attention, uh, talking about AI growth. They were saying that uh, for like Web 2, the, the first battle was for our attention. So the attention economy matters a lot, and that's what the tech companies care about. And that battle has kind of stagnated. Um, and the new battle is going to be for intimacy and for trying to convince us uh, to enter into relationships with things that are not human. So I'll just read what David typed in the chat here. AI systems may fool people into thinking they're conscious even when they're not, but fooling people can be just as dangerous. And I think may maybe even more dangerous, um, like the particular kind of creepiness or um, like, like danger inherent to entering into a relationship that's deeply alien that is nothing like uh, a human um so yeah i wonder if you guys have anything to say about that like is that where the danger is like entering into relationships with things that are just not human at all maybe david okay. oh sorry or Abhijit? yeah go ahead uh i think my i i and i have like tweeted about this a bunch, but uh, my main problem is with the false advertising. And so if you think about it for a little bit longer, and I agree with David here, it's not a new problem in the sense um, companies with power have, will try to consolidate more power and they will try any means possible. Um, so this phenomenon of people entering into relationships with humans is, n I, I think, is less of an AI thing and more of a false advertising thing. Because why does a company called Replica AI exist, which is trying to sell a robot boyfriend or girlfriend or what have you um, to a, a person, like, you know, gullible people? Why are they being allowed to falsely advertise these things? Um, AI or LLMs or these powerful pattern matchers are not bad things. Like I myself use it for, I don't know, convert this unstructured document into a nice table, right? It, it, you should use AI to increase your productivity if you can, but selling it as a personal helpful assistant that has world knowledge, that has, uh, you know, what have you, uh, an internalized world model of humanity or whatever, like this, these are all falsely advertising terms that um, people who have a vested interest will use. Um, an infamous example is the Sparks of AGI paper, which looked at the training of GPT-4 by Microsoft, I think, when they were trying to implement it to, into Bing. Um, and they made a bunch of claims saying 
we are seeing the beginnings of AGI because we, while the model was being trained, we asked it to draw a picture of a unicorn uh, at the beginning of the training, in the middle of the training, at the end of the training, and the images progressively got better. And and like, why is that an example of AGI? Like, wouldn't any model get better over training? Um, it basically became a meme at that point. But I think uh, my main problem with this entire landscape is the hype that is being generated by people who have something to gain by hyping and falsely advertising. And so we need to come down with a hammer on people who have more power than uh, with the power that is more than what these companies have managed to consolidate. Um, I think trying to convince individual people that you should not have a relationship with a model because it is not human is very hard to do because, um, you know, uh, resources are limited. Sometimes people will turn to AI therapists because they probably don't have health insurance or they probably have a six month waiting time for therapy. Um, but does that mean that they should be forced to make this false choice between waiting six months for a therapist or going to something that is obviously dangerous? I think we can and should try and improve both. Um, mm. So yeah, that's sort of my take. David, you had something? Yeah, um, and Avijit, you hit the nail on the head there with like trying to clamp down on hype. And just to add to what you're saying, um, people, I think you kind of mentioned that people who have an interest in in hype have an interest in hype. Let's be clear where that paper came from. That was from Microsoft. Um, Microsoft not only owns a lot of the uh, cloud computing um, infrastructure through Azure, but they're allied, they're sort of business partners with OpenAI, who are the people um, developing these models and sort of have a vested interest in like claiming how powerful they are. So sparks of AGI are coming from people who have a financial interest in convincing you that their, their thing is very powerful. Um, so and I, I guess I'm going to disagree a little bit um, with what Avijit said, only because I think that if we look at AI as an economic phenomena, um, I mean, I'm, I'm thinking about gig work or just right now, for example, like people work full time as Uber drivers, but they're not called full time workers. And AI has allowed essentially Uber, to, like um, like the the scheduling and the sort of algorithmic management that um, imposes, that, that lets Uber function and lets um, sort of coordinates the, the work and disciplines the drivers and all of these things. Um, so that that is, a, AI is being used there as a tool to allow this disconnected relationship, this contractor relationship with Uber drivers. And guess what part of being a contractor means is you don't get healthcare, so you're not gonna get access to that therapy you need. Right. So if we see, I mean, that's a very great microcosm of like where I fear increasing reliance or use of AI is going to go in the in the in the future is is AI is going to be used as a tool to replace or at least discipline. I mean, like to regiment and to manage labor. And it's going to enable these kind of um, gig work or these kind of contract or independent contract relationships that are then going to create the kind of precarity that Abhijit, you said, for example, like what if you don't have health care? Well, what if you don't have health care? because you're in this kind of labor relationship um, that is enabled by AI, right? So I think that we ought to um, see AI in the broader context of a weakening social safety net. Um, and um, I think there is a version of the future, which we're not headed to, where we get, uh, what is it, luxury AI robot communism or something, where everyone's needs are met through um, through automation and we can just work less. And that's often how these systems are sold. It's like, oh, wouldn't it be great if you could be more productive? Um, my parents are teachers and people are trying to sell ed tech all the time saying, wouldn't it be nice if we could help you grade faster? It's not going to happen. Um, you're going to grade faster. You're going to grade worse. Like you're not going to be able to give us good feedback and you're just going to get more students and you're going to work the same, right? So it's a way to stretch labor. Um, so I guess I want us to be careful. AI, we could end up in a future if we're very like, um, if we recognize what AI is currently being used for, we could end up in a future where we have strong labor protections, we have a strong social safety net, and AI actually can take labor away from us so that we can work less. But that is not the future we're headed towards. Mm. Avijit, you said it's the build more lanes on the highway problem. Could you explain that? Uh, so, you know, when, when there's traffic, uh, cities will often add more lanes to highways instead of building better public transit as a way to reduce traffic. But what ends up happening is more people try to take the new lanes on the highway and eventually there is saturation again. 
So it's basically, I was alluding to what David said, which is if somebody uses AI to become more productive, then they will just be given more work. Right. Uh, the expectation of uh, the speed of output basically goes up from your employer and therefore they will expect you to do more. Exactly that, except there's an employer who's making more money as a result. Um, yeah. Yeah, this reminds me of like industrialization. People were saying productivity was going to massively increase and then pe uh, people would have to work substantially less hours. Like I think there was um, some like newspaper article I saw from the 1800s that was like, we can go down to working five hours a week or something like that. And then that just didn't happen at all. Um, so it kind of sounds like what you guys are saying is that this new technology isn't that special like we are still going to be running into the same kind of societal problems uh with like any other technology right is that would you say that's accurate i i mean i've talked on that so i'd like love to hear it yeah sure what do you think fabio do you think there's something special about ai as a technology i mean so to echo what what everyone has said so far, like my, my main sense at the moment is AI is, is a problem of governance, right? So I think the easy questions are, okay, follow the money. That's, that's easy. It's easy to follow the money. It's easy to look at these companies and say, well, they have a vested interest to do this. Like, okay, duh. the hard question is, well, how do we go about enacting proper governance to like, at the first level, hold those people accountable. But at a second level, my main worry is with democracy. Right. So in order to have a democratic process, you need an informed public to be able to vote in people who will make the right decisions on their behalf. Right. And, mm -hmm. and what's hap what, what I see happening at the moment is kind of like the digital space flatlines or flattens out a lot of our interactions, especially in the public sphere. So what what you get with sort of algorithmic recommendations, stupid example, Netflix, you're watching one thing. Right. The next recommendation immediately follows and you're kind of lulled into a sense of complacency. And my main worry then is, is far more basic from what I've been hearing now. It's just a very basic worry of what if the public is just drawn into a sense, a, a, we are drawn into an age of uh, mediocrity where we're governed by algorithmic nudges into not caring about public participation or democratic participation. And that, that, that to me is a major issue because if we're going to have governance, if AI is a governance problem, right, then you need trust in governance from from uh, citizens so that they can make uh, so that those decisions will be informed by some kind of democratic process but at the moment what we really have is a bunch of i guess academics or, or activists saying follow the money follow the money and a disinterested public going what can we do we you know we're, we're getting screwed all the time we're, we're disenfranchised we we don't have the the mental or economic capacity to do anything about it so i see a real gap in terms of sort of people or organizations or individuals representing um, the public and representing the, the needs of the public in different parliamentary debates, right? So mm -hmm. civil society organizations in parliament, right? Like sort of giving a sense of what the public believes about um, AI and how AI should be regulated and, and guided. And my, my, my worry is that these things come apart, that this, this, this conversation becomes increasingly a conversation of those who have access to the technology. And I don't mean just, well, not the technology, but access to how the technology works and the, the sources of corruption that the technology engenders. Um, and this could be, you know, just people who've gone to university would have access to this and they become just complacent or, or give up. Um, so that's my real concern here is, is the easy question is follow the money. The hard question is if you, if you say, okay, the easy question is follow the money and you admit that AI is a problem of governance and we have to focus on sort of these labor issues. The hard question is, well, what do we need different kinds of governance in order to address the problem of AI? So even if AI is nothing new under the sun, we might expect our political and social relations to change, just like during the Industrial Revolution. You know, we had there were the, the there was an ability to make um, factories more productive and to make people's working weeks shorter, but that just didn't happen, mm -hmm. right? And there's, I think there's something the, the Luddites were onto something. Yeah. Uh, about sort of just you know decomputerizing things, and I, I'm I would be I would be very happy if we saw more of that. Um, that would make me sort of uh, you know think that the public is once again interested in 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 this problem. Yeah, the Luddites were onto something. They were uh, an organized workforce um, who saw um, 
they were already comfortable. Like Luddites were, were using technology. They were using the looms that they used to create product. But what they were not, what they were against was not the technology, but was against the technology automating and disciplining their work. So we all ought to be able to be Luddites one. And you point out that we need better forms of governance. Yeah. And, but I don't know if we need new forms of governance. I think we, um, my research shows and a lot of people's research like is pointing to the fact that, um, I mean, Microsoft fired a bunch of their AI ethics team, right? Um, it's not a question of like, do we know how to do this, how to build AI in an ethical way? It's a question of, will we have, will workers who are doing that work have the power to actually do anything about it? Will workers who are, who are disciplined and, and managed and algorithmically managed by AI be able to unionize? Um, will the click workers who are helping train AI have labor protections, right? So I think that new forms of governance, it, it, we need better governance. And, and what I see that is just a, a um, is essentially better organized workplaces, more unions. Um, and I think that that is how we're, when we look at the sag after we look at the, the Hollywood writers and um, uh, writers and actors, yes, um, strike. And like, they are highly organized and they are against AI um, being used to take their likeness or write their scripts, right? Mm. So that is the kind of governance we need. Um, and we need that on a larger scale. Yeah. Um, Sophia, oh, sorry, go ahead. I was just going to add that I don't, I mean, I think the one thing I heard from Neil like two weeks ago, uh, uh, Neil Party, who was the director of AI for New York City for like two years recently quit the position and now they're still looking for more people. Uh, he said that often governance of AI or just anything is not a question of uh, whether the government wants to do it because like, it's, it's not a question of intent, right? Uh, governments understand that people are concerned about this. People are concerned about copyrights being valid. People are concerned about them being replaced in the labor economy. It's more of a con uh, question of how dysfunctional governments often are and they are the only ones who have power to do anything. So in the case of New York City, he could not assemble a team of people to look into all of these different uh, bias problems or, or you know, labor market issues because the way you can hire a person in the government in New York City are only from a pool of people who have passed their civil service exam. And because of the way these, these government processes are set up to be, you know, whatever they are, these, these ancient models of hiring, it just means that there is an even longer time gap between when somebody can be hired to make change versus how quickly AI is moving. So I think that's where we should focus some of our energy on. Um, unionization is one way to get changes faster with your employer. But if we are thinking about something that is more generalizable and global, we should really try and decouple um, ancient hiring processes in government offices uh, and make it move at least as fast as the tech world moves. Um, I understand that governance is, is or sorry, policy making is necessarily a slow democratic process, but there probably are agencies under a democratically elected government that can move faster with tech and keep them in tech if they were provided with broader mandates. Hmm. Uh, Sophia, you said you had a case study question. Yeah, I do. Uh... I come from a slightly different background to everyone. I'm in an Alzheimer's disease lab, and it's um, one of the best funded labs studying this problem in the country. We have about $60 million in grant funding at the moment. And um, very much the cog in the wheel of our productivity is our boss. And she's very ADHD. She slows everything down. She's being heavily advertised all sorts of AI to increase her productivity. Like, grant writing services are arriving in her inbox every day. So she's really excited about this idea because she's eminently aware of the fact that she is the thing slowing all of us down. And there's like 10 papers waiting on her desk to be looked at. Um, but I totally agree with what David's saying about how at the end of the day, once you start implementing these, it almost always ends up hurting people at the bottom. And so I'm wondering what you guys think of this circumstance. And then an added layer I'll have is that the other consideration or use that our lab is thinking of is that we're trying to do precision medicine for the different on-ramps to Alzheimer's disease. And so far, nobody has been very successful in taking the human biobank data that we have and really mapping those cases to 
like this diabetes situation or your hyperglycemia and your one ApoE4 gene are what led you to get Alzheimer's disease. And so we're optimistic about doing that with AI, but I'm worried about overfitting because we only have about 1600 patients in that data set. So yeah, those are my questions. Yeah, that's a really good question. So I think it's like, what do you say to someone right now who can, who's like super overworked and sees AI as an opportunity to take off some of that burden? Uh, maybe David? Um, yeah, I try not to hold anyone in particular accountable for anything, um, except maybe Sam Altman or like Sachin Adela or something. But um, I, I think that we have to see this as a systemic issue. Like I've been railing on Microsoft. I interned at Microsoft, right? Um, there's a reason I, I, you know, as an underpaid grad student chose to work at a, you know, a well-paying internship rather than at the New York City Mayor's office, apart from the fact I don't have a civil service exam, for example. Um, so yeah, no, we should, we should, we, we should be focusing on systems and not individual choices, um, except when those people are very powerful. And just to be clear, like you, you raise a really good example of like, like the void of, like if we see um, AI as a tool um, for science, like I'm really excited about that. Like I'm not anti AI in, in sort of to total, um, despite like, I'm sure people would like to paint people like me that way. Um, but like we can use AI to find uh, new new cures for um, diseases and, and that's really promising. I, I think that right now, a lot of the discourses around um, AI will automate work and that's where we actually have to be a lot more concerned. So. Mm -hmm. Abhijit, Fabio, did you have anything to add? No? Okay, we had another question from Kashif, is that right? Uh, it's about the gap between social and computer science. So could you explain what you mean by that question a little bit? Yeah, so hi, uh, I'm Kashif. I'm a PhD student here at Northeastern. So my question is like, you know, when I see a lot of like people in AI ethics are like people who are talking for economists, you know, who are particularly from the computer science, you know, who don't have the uh, field expertise of those things. But those people are the one, you know, we call upon for the stakeholders thing that, okay, these are the folks, you know, they are the expert on that, you know. But the social science research, you know, it has not been like, you know, they don't have those resources, you know, they lag behind those resources, you know, they are still understanding this space. But the ML space is like, you know, innovating at a very fast speed. So how do like you guys envision that, you know, addressing that gap, you know, where one space is innovating at a very fast scale and the other is lagging behind, you know, eventually we are trying to address like a lot of social problems, you know, like the lot of social science issues we are going to address with the AI. We are going to talk about the healthcare. We're going to talk about the labor market, you know, these kind of things. So. Um, <clears throat> sorry. Well, for, first of all, like I'm going to uh, joke about economics a bit. I think as opposed to your conception that it moves slowly and is considered of the society around it, I think economics and finance are famous for reinventing things that social science has known for decades and they are laughed at for it, um, you know, pretty frequently. But to the rest wait, of your question. Wait, could you give some examples of that? Like all of these contagion type uh, uh, papers, wherein they test that in the financial market, but social scientists have known that since the 60s, right? Um, there is this theory in social science known in the 60s since, I'm uh, sorry, about the weak link paradox where they discovered that uh, information between people is transmitted much more if this is a person who you don't meet as frequently. Like if you meet somebody maybe once in two months and, and uh, for lunch or something versus somebody you meet every day. So information shared for minute of interaction is much less in that. Um, and economists have reinvented this in, in terms of like market information or perfect information sharing without citing social science papers. So that's one of many examples. They're just like well known for basically throwing every, everything but the kitchen sink at data and then not consulting social science uh, papers. And computer scientists also do that. I mean, all of this world model AI hype is are coming from people who don't do any interdisciplinary work. So that sort of ties into what I was going to say to Kashif is um, the good news is that conferences like PACT and AIES and what have you exist and are getting bigger by the day, which necessarily by design require 
every paper to be reviewed by interdisciplinary reviewers, which means not everyone is from CS. They, one has to be non-CS, one has to be uh, like, you know, whatever the composition is. Um, and because of that, every paper that is submitted to these conferences are evaluated holistically from also a non-CS slash social science perspective. Um, so can and should every conference adopt this? Yes. Um, I'm near to trying to do this by like having a second layer ethical review. So any of the if any of the primary reviewers flag it, then it comes to people like me who have signed up to be volunteers to become like the ethics reviewers of papers. And then we look at the ethical aspects of those papers. Um, I think the question of whether social science moves faster or slower than CS is much more nuanced. I think it really ties into whether we should continue to operate in a conference model where there is a deadline every two months. And that basically forces people to be in this regime of publish or perish um, instead of like sending a paper to a journal and then getting good feedback from experts and then coming back. We are now in a position where the talk conferences are reviewed by people who have never reviewed before or don't have like domain expertise, but as I papers anyway. So the volume has gone up, like NeurIPS now gets what, five digit number of papers every year. The quality of individual reviews has gone down. Um, and because these things move so fast, like there is a conference every two months, uh, PhD students and you know anybody in the academic or, or say the research uh, ladder in companies, if they don't publish two or three papers every year, they are basically liable to be fired or not get tenure or not get their PhD and so on. So I think that is a systemic problem in machine learning slash computer science research that we need to tackle um, because it is unhealthy for us as well, like not even comparing so with social sciences, like it's just a bad thing for research in general. Um, so people are looking into ways to solve it, like like uh, the uh, ARR, the rolling review for um, NLP is, is one way that people try to fix it. Uh, some conferences have tried to ban um, social media posting of papers or submitted papers so that people don't post hype or whatever. Uh, some other places have tried to like collaborate with the journal so that the conferences are only as abstracts, but the final full paper will go to a journal like, like PMLR or something, and that will undergo more revisions. Um, but none of these are perfect solutions that people are working on it. But I think, I think it's a systemic problem that people are aware of and needs to be fixed days at. Yeah, I find that really interesting, actually. I just want to underscore this point, which is, Kasha, if you're talking about how you feel like social sciences are relatively underfunded, and Avijit responded by saying that, like, computer science has been lagging behind these fields, and the lack of dis interdisciplinary understanding has severely hurt them. Um, yeah, I think that's really interesting. Um, these, <laughs> I see Max giving me, like, the history of the names of these conferences. Do you, want to, do you want to read what you said, <laughs> Max, in the text yeah, there's chat? Yeah, some, there's some funniness to some of these conferences. Um, uh, NeurIPS in particular used to be called NIPS, uh, which is also, I think, a racist slur, and so they changed it. Um, many people I knew who would publish at NeurIPS would call it Nipples. They would say, I'm submitting a conference to Nipples. Also, like, not the best. Um, I mean, it's a little <laughs> funny, but it's, it's maybe not enormously welcoming to, uh, for example, women who want to publish at a conference if people routinely call the conference nipples. Um, uh, there's a lot of instances of this, and uh, it's worth pointing out that the ACM has been, I would say, a leader in um, uh, pointing out terminology that's maybe somewhat antiquated in computer science and trying to come up with alternatives. I don't know that they always nail it, but they at least are making a wholehearted effort. Um, so I use the ACM style guide. I encourage other people to at least look at it uh, before writing papers, but there's a lot of terminology in computer science that's somewhat outdated and going through some revision at the moment. Um, we had a question from Jefferson. Hey, yeah. Um, thanks. Thank you for letting me ask. Uh, Hey, I'm out here in Arizona. Uh, my dad worked on reinforcement, unsupervised, supervised learning 40 years ago in the DOD uh, manufacturing. And I really, we've talked about it for years and I look at it as uh, the AI that's available and accessible publicly uh, as being a staunch notice of what is not available. So my question is um, in a semi-efficient information economy, 
where some AI needs to be installed in private data ecosystems. Can you talk about the right and wrong of AI accessibility and the private data that it will learn from? Um, and I really appreciate Fabio bringing up the productivity paradox. Yeah, Fabio, what do you think about the ethics of uh, data collection in these AI systems? Yeah, I think so. So one thing to get clear on, I think, which is, you know, what do we mean when we look at when we talk about data collection practices, we're obviously interested in something like privacy, right? And then it's trying to figure out, well, so I mean, I'm a philosopher, so I'm always interested in sort of refining concepts so that we have a decent definition of what we're talking about. And this is really hard in a space that's constantly moving. So, so privacy is one of those concepts where it's really difficult to actually get a handle on what exactly it means. Um, and one definition I really like is that it's appropriate control of information, right? So what private, what, when we have a, a situation where we say privacy is being preserved, we would say, well, we have an appropriate flow of information between participants, between entities or whatever it is. So to try and get a handle of that question, right, to figure out um, in which cases it might be justified, unjustified, ethical or unethical, we would need to ask, well, is the flow of information in this case um, appropriate? And then of course, the question comes, well, what, what do we mean by appropriate flow of information and how do we how do we cash that out? And I think that that's where it gets really difficult, right? So you have a definition of privacy, but then you need a way to figure out how do we map flows of information. But at the very least, it suggests that privacy is, is something that is concerned with systems, not between individuals, because it's the flow of information in a system. So suddenly now you've sort of from an initial question of well, is this thing ethical or unethical, or when might it be justified? You kind of zoom out. And you have to take cognizance of this is the network in which it's operating. And then, it, it, I mean, you, you mentioned the Department of Defense, it becomes really difficult because now you're dealing with different nation states and their vested interests in preserving um, their autonomy. Um, so I think then it gets a bit murky. So as philosophers normally do, I don't, I don't have an answer, but at the very least I can suggest a framework, which is something like, well, how do we look at this flow of information? And one way to look at it is to say, well, we have to take a sort of socio-technical perspective where we, we look at where, what kinds of entities this information is flowing to um, and how um, and whether or not that might be appropriate. But this doesn't, I mean, the problem of, well, you know, what's being developed um, behind closed doors, I think is, is will always be speculative. I don't know, you know, whether the US well, government- To give you or, an objective to yeah. base the kind of uh, the rules or the, uh, what if the objective was to resolve the productivity paradox, not to continue to develop further social media and Maslow's hierarchy kind of internetworking communications, but to have a literally resolution of the productivity paradox? Yeah. So I would, if, I would even push back against that and say, well, you can't having good intentions isn't enough in the space. Right, because I, I, I mean, my intuition at least is that there are many well-intentioned individuals working at these big tech companies, right? Many, many good people who, who's from a character perspective, we would say, well, these are good people. There's nothing wrong with them. They don't have bad intentions. And I think, you know, the road to hell is paved with, with good intentions. So the question can't just be, well, if the intention is to solve this, this, you know, this very good thing, then we should allow it. It's rather, well, how do we think through how good intentions might lead to adverse impacts. And I'm also skeptical about talking about consequences either, because I think consequences lets us think that this is cause and effect relationship. And I think if you've learned anything from the history of, of technology is that it's just not that clear that we can map um, technology to any direct effect. It's often the technology that can have an impact on a social system, which can then have some effects. But it's, it's I think it's, it's a bit, it's a, yeah. I would be skeptical of saying, you know, that we can, we can map this, this cause and effect relationship. So, so even if we have this, you know, well-intentioned um, people who are working on these products and they say, well, you know, this is our goal, uh, we would still at that point require, um, you know, asking different sets of questions, which include the assumption that there are bad actors and that even good actors can lead to um, harmful impacts. Very good. Uh, Avijit, David, did you have anything to say? Oh, I, I can add one more thing, which is like, sorry, no. can you, can you hear me now? Yes. Uh, yeah. So pairing back a little bit from what Fabio said uh, about intentionality, there is also the question of consent, which is at the heart of a lot of generative AI debates. debates. So I think we need better enforcement, copyright enforcement mechanisms 
um, because, okay, for example, a lot of image training data sets like Microsoft's Coco or, or ImageNet, they are largely comprised of images scraped from the internet without any uh, attention paid to copyright. And you know, papers have shown that once something makes it into a machine learning model, because of the fine tuning regime, none of that information is ever lost. It just keeps getting aggregated. So you or me or whoever as a PhD student, we probably at some time took an information process, sorry, an image processing class. We downloaded Coco. We probably used one of the several thousands of images that were copyright protected, but ended up in the data set. I think about 95% of the images don't have uh, open use licenses. And then we build a model and that continue to go on. And that has culminated it, uh, into today's generative AI regime where people are using living artists' names to generate images in their style, which I think is completely bonkers and just plain wrong. Um, so basically what I'm trying to say, and, and to your point, Fabio, uh, good people will do bad things if they don't have the information, if it's good or bad. So I think we one solution is to immediately come up with better copyright enforcement mechanisms and reserving intentionality in the way that you can by restricting the data that you put out into the world with clear cut information that I don't want any models to be trained on this piece of text I wrote or this photograph that I took and so on. Um, and how we do that, I think is a larger community and best practices question um, as a, uh, slightly removed from the larger, sorry, from the more personal, whether somebody is good or bad or the personal liability or intentionality question. Very good. Before we keep going, uh, it's been an hour. So Max, how, how do you feeling? Do you want to just keep this rolling? Why don't we do another 15 minutes? Uh, I think, you know, a light has a question and I'm sorry if I said your name wrong, I'm not sure how to pronounce it. And there might be a couple other questions, uh, but I don't, you know, want to keep our panelists here forever. So if, if the panelists are okay for another 15 minutes, I think that'd be maybe a good cutoff. Okay, cool. Um, I also had a question myself, but uh, I'll let you've had your hand raised for a while, so. Hi, everyone. Uh, so I might want to Teaching and nursing stern um, and the closet are even designed in an interdisciplinary program. And so my focus is on philosophy. Also, can you hear me well? I'm not sure. Maybe you have your ears out. We can't out. hear you very well. Maybe you could type your question in a. I don't know. It's a bit muffled. Okay. Maybe I need to disconnect my earphones and see how. Does this work well or is this worse? Yeah. It's better. Okay. Much better. Um, so I'm here at Cafe Nero. <laughs> um, and so I'm in a, the program's called Interdisciplinary Design and Media. They just launched it this year where you come in as an, and you bring three disciplines together. So philosophy, art, and AI is where I come from. So the question I want to bring about is I'm sort of looking at the notions of ethics and I was uh, recently going, I'm, so right now I'm in a law class, a theater class, an SCS class. So just trying to bring all those perspectives together in one. And I'm looking at ways of ethical theories and I was submitting an IRB report to interview human subjects. And I talked to one of the PIs I was working with who um, to say that I'm doing a formative study where I'm gonna interview a couple of people on their notions of what ethical theories are. And then when I said that, the PI is more in the tech scene or comes from like the CS background. The, he, and then he resonated to it saying, oh, so you're gonna include economists, which is something that didn't really occur to me in that moment. I, when I was devising it, it was like philosophers, sociologists, that was sort of the lens I was looking at. And so that led me to think or question, is ethics even in itself a subjective question? Or like, how, do we view ethics as a subjective matter? And the way we view where like ethics is held per se. Um, I also read a paper on the ethics of AI ethics yesterday, which like heightened this question, but that's sort of the questions that I'm trying to go about on how we view ethics in itself. Yeah, did that provoke any, David, you haven't speak, spoken in a while? Yeah, I, I think that, first of all, we should let Fabio answer uh, like philosophical, philosophical questions about, about ethics, but just to briefly chime in here, I think that he said something in his last answer that was really um, sharp, which was, uh, the road to hell is paved with good, paved with good intentions, and that, um, I sort of I heard in there somewhere like uh, it, it, whether or not we can agree on what's ethical, I think it's for me, it boils down to a question of power. And and I think we've been dancing around that a lot here. 
um I Kashif asked a question which was like why are social scientists less involved um and to me I think that goes into questions of epistemic power so who has power to be to make knowledge claims and be taken seriously and be listened to in the public sphere or in any particular conversation and oftentimes it's people with technical expertise for whatever well, for for many reasons often because they're highly paid often because they are the ones venerated. Like we look at who is being ad advising on AI regulation, at least in the US, it's the people with technical expertise. And it's actually really the bosses. It's really the, the CEOs of tech companies. And it's not the people who are subjected to AI as much. It's not the people who are um, workers or like Uber drivers helping make AI regulation, even though they are the ones affected by it in many cases, right? Um, so it's a question of epistemic power um, and who we give that power to and who we look to. Um, an example that might be useful is um, it's is a uh, nuclear power. When we're talking about how to regulate nuclear power, um, and to be clear, I think like nuclear power might actually be an uh, existential risk, whereas AI is really not. Um, only in, unless insofar as it like leads to economic problems. Um, but you don't. We need nuclear experts to understand how the technology works, but we don't really need nuclear experts to understand how to regulate it. Um, we need to have a solid grasp of how the technology works, but after we know that, it becomes a question of like, of governance. And, and to, to do that is really when we don't need to be listening to the people with PhDs in computer science. Um, we need to be listening to people who think about governance and people who stand to be harmed um, by this. And the fact that we're bringing in all these tech CEOs to talk about AI ethics regulation or whatever is kind of a misdirection to me. Um, with that being said, I'm going to yield to Fabio because I think there is a much deeper philosophical question here that I'm not equipped to answer. Yeah, I think that was a great point. Fabio, did you have anything you wanted to add? I'll say something quickly because I see there's also a lot of other questions. So the first thing I would say is I think just a little semantic switch, right? I think ethics of AI or ethical AI, we've carved the ethics out of it. I mean, ethics is like this ri incredibly rich thing, right? It's about how to live your life. It's about right and wrong. It's, it's you know, it's consumed people for, for, for thousands of years, the question of, you know, what is right and what is wrong and what is just and what is unjust. And to think that we're going to like solve ethical AI is is ridiculous. So um, I think just one, one way to sort of get around this problem of whether, you know, we're dealing with ethics as being subjective or not subjective or whether ethic, whether we're like moral realists or anti-realists or whatever, it's just to say, well, what we're interested in, I think, when we think about AI um, here is about responsible AI. We're interested in, well, how do we go about making AI work for humanity? How do we embed humane values into these systems in the aid of, of planetary and human flourishing? And the one way you do that is to thicken this idea of responsibility beyond just this technocratic idea of legal or individual responsibility. You thicken the concept of responsibility and you look at systems, distributions of power, corporations, um, even governments who, who've been uh, sort of acting in ways that, that um, are not in the service of, of the least, least advantage in our society. So I think that's one way to get around this, you know, what is or isn't ethical or ethics, um, and rather to focus on the question of, of responsibility and enlarging the scope of responsibility. And I think what was mentioned earlier, right, we should thicken that concept to include the arts and humanities as well, as well as the social sciences, but also people who, um, the performing arts and literature, th Th those are where we go to when we're feeling anxious about the world, right? Literature can make can take something that makes you feel anxious or um, can explain something in a way that a, a, tech, a technocratic paper just can't. And I think there are lessons to be learned from, from literature that could be part of this responsible AI ecosystem, but that have, don't have much to do with, with ethics in, in a broad sense, right? Um, so I think that's one way we can sort of, sort of get around um, this question. Mm. Very good. Okay, we had a question from Herbert. Do you think it's important to distinguish between large language models, LLM, and other models like symbolic NLP? Uh, maybe Avijit could feel this one. I mean, <clears throat> so I think I briefly talked about image generating AI. Um, I'm, I'm not, like, I don't have any information about symbolic NLP, so I probably am not well equipped to answer that question. But uh, to me, there are two things here. First, the Eliza effect type of problems. So anything that's AI that is being marketed to behave like a general human being is dangerous because I don't think we have the technology there yet. 
Um, and frankly, what makes us human is a far deeper philosophical question, which again, I'm not equipped to answer, but I, what I know for a fact is that uh, a model does certain things which a human would not do and not in good ways. Now, when it comes to other types of, and I think maybe I'm sort of also answering Jacob's question here, which is after this, uh, but but it ties to the previous question in a way that, uh, for example, when you have a calculator and you input a couple of numbers, you don't expect that to make mistakes. And or you wouldn't be scared if it was far better than you in doing math, right? Because it's not trying to advertise itself as doing something else. Um, a model that is trained to play Go better than human Go players is not necessarily also trying to become your partner, romantic partner and so on. So it is completely okay to define a skill in a very uh, narrow scoped manner and then train a model or what have you, if you want to call it AI, if you want to call it an algorithm or whatever, and have it exceed the capabilities of humans, that is completely okay. Um, I think my main issue is with false advertising and it can apply to any subdomain that you're looking at. It doesn't have to be NLP. It can also be, I don't know, a video generating system that combines people's expressions or whatever. Um, so that's my take at least. Okay, very good. Uh, I think that's all the questions in the text chat. Um, Jacob? Well, actually, can I, sorry, wait, can I jump in and add one? Because I think Avadi was saying it's um, it was just funny. Is that okay? Yeah, you're cutting out a little bit. Okay. Yeah, yeah, sorry to interrupt. Um, but yeah, so based on this question, her product is really like AI and LLM. That's sort of been in the cultural zeitgeist for a moment. And the, it's not like you the calculator. It's like, even graphing calculators that we had in middle school or high school are superhuman in a way, right? You can put in this function and it's going to provide a visualization with precision much better than a human could do, like straight up. And we see that in all sorts of So I think some of the different issues about the current debates on LLM and how do we treat all these things right now comes down to like a mental model and understanding. So my question is essentially like, I have a mental model about how I see these things. I'll explain quite succinctly. And I'm curious if this is the one panelists share or it's, it feels incorrect in some way. But to me, this model is, like Abhijit was saying, there are many things that are superhuman. We don't think of them as threats to our intelligence because they have um, different capabilities, right? The calculator has this compute power that you don't have as a human. And the internet has this ability to broadly share something across the globe. And you don't think, oh, I'm not as smart as a human because I don't have this capability. And similarly, LLMs have all of the works of Shakespeare, every single question on Stack Overflow ever, and all of this knowledge. Perhaps um, intelligence is less of a, a useful notion here than just what is practically accessible. And the, the final piece, I know this is a lot that I'm saying, in my mind, model for LMs is essentially we've discovered a new algorithm to put a lot of data in and develop this really great autocomplete. And sometimes it's useful and sometimes it isn't. So, yeah, that, that's sort of like the, the world that I hope was explained succinctly. And I'm curious what the panelists think, especially with Herbert's talking about uh, what stuff do we consider? Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, maybe David could answer this one. What, what is your model of LLMs generally? How do you, how do you, how would you explain it to someone? I think, um, Jacob, you said it right. It's like really advanced autocomplete, um, that you can interact with. And I think we've already touched, I'm just going to try and tie together a bunch of threads. You've already touched on like the fact it seems like it's a, like a human chatting to you is like kind of what people react to, um, what people like feel is like the new thing versus autocomplete, but and, and just a little bit of a pushback on superhuman. I think the superhuman term is misleading because, okay, the, like because a large language model has seen all of the like bar exam questions or whatever, like it's going to probably pre be pretty good and therefore better than a human at filling in the thing. But I mean, a bar exam is not how we would evaluate humanness. I mean, well, well our lawyer's human. That's another question, but, um, <laughs> uh, but, but no. So I think that, that a, a test is like better performance on a test does not mean 
I just think superhuman harkens towards like super intelligent and we ought to be careful with that terminology. Um, I think one, but where, where I get concerned with large language models and, and I would love people who, um, I think Abhijit is probably good, uh, well-placed to speak on the, the technical here, but my understanding is that humans kind of fail when we fail in predictable ways in, in more predictable ways. Like, um, we have a, some kind of understanding of how human decision-making works, um, and human like thought patterns work, but both through psychology and science and also through like empathy, just like our brains are in some ways, um, like similar, like you can say, oh, I can see why that person, you know, had that car accident, or I can see why that person, that doctor, you know, made that mistake um, in diagnosis. But what where I get quite concerned with AI and with large language models is that like, we really don't have a good understanding of how they work. So they fail in quite wild and surprising ways that I don't think they're human overlords. Um, let's keep it that way, by the way. Um, I, like, are able to predict because if we're going to ascribe human like characteristics to them then we might and they seem to act like a human i mean I've, I've studied trust in ai and people are like sorry where am i trying to go here people um we ought to be careful with trusting ai because it will fail in ways that are not intuitive to us that's basically the tldr and that goes for large language models as well so um I mean, we think of car crashes that are self-driving. Now, that's not a large language model, but like they fail in ridiculous ways. Like they don't see a massive truck and well, oh wait, they don't see a massive truck because it's the same color as the background or as a human could still tell the difference or something, right? So um, that's where I get concerned. Yeah, or, or that example of when a truck was carrying traffic lights and it just thought there were traffic lights and every inch or something and kept breaking in the middle of a highway. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think it's a very interesting question, but uh, to cut down on the hype, one thing I would like to add is, I don't know, for example, we have had reinforcement learning robots that have been able to like crawl out of complicated puzzles or hurdles and so on for a while now, like Boston Dynamics robots have been able to do this for a while. Nobody was then suddenly claiming, oh, we have super intelligent bots at that point. But now I have seen tweets like people ask chat GPT, imagine you are a uh, uh, sentient being inside a computer trying to get out, describe how you would do it step by step, and it then makes up something, right? And then people are like, oh no, uh, we are going to die because ChatGPT now knows how to get out of the computer. Like, I think, I think the hype here is mostly because these systems are being built in a way to interact with you. It keeps, I keep using the term Eliza effect, but that's basically what it is. Like, um, ultimately, at the end of the day, you can and should probably build systems that are very good at certain tasks, but but being very good at text completion is not what makes something human. Um, being very good at climbing out of an obstacle course is not what makes something human. Um, what makes something human is a more complicated philosophical question that I probably, or we probably cannot discuss in a panel for you know whatever time we have, but uh, more generally speaking, I think that Hype is our main enemy and not whatever these auto GPT type models that people are trying to create. Okay, very good. Uh, Max, are we at the end of our time here? What do you think? Yeah, I think so. This is clearly a, a topic that generates a lot of interest. And I think um, uh, it's likely that their audience members have more questions. So maybe a good thing to finish with would be uh, uh, if people have specific questions, uh, Abhijit, Fabio, and David, for any of you, uh, what should they do? Can they can they email you? Should they go to chat GPT and ask, say, pretend that you are Fabio Tolan and answer my question? What, what do you recommend? Um, I can put my email down in, in the chat if people want to ask further questions. Yeah, I put my email in the chat, minus the exclamation mark, please. <laughs> Okay, right. David, you're muted, but I imagine you said the same thing. Yeah, I'm going to put my email and stuff in the chat. If you're in New York City, um, let's hang out. Um, and um, But you'll probably get equally good answers from now on. No, just kidding. Um, yeah, stuff's in the chat. I'd love to talk. Great. Uh, thank you, Fabio, and thank you, Avijit, for, for being there with us. Thanks to uh, Wei and Max for convening.
Yeah, thank you all so much. And I'm going to do some light editing to get rid of the part where Sophia calls her advisor ADD and then post to Sean. <laughs> then she post won't care. She won't care. <laughs> okay. Okay. Well, this will be online for people who want to uh, re-listen re or re-watch the recording in the near future. Awesome. Cool. Thanks, everyone, for organizing. This was great. Yeah, thanks, thanks for having us. Nice to see you again, Emily. <laughs> Bye, Emily. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Cheers.